in the uh, upper part of, the, of the, the church. And I read his works, and I read the works of all the other people in this area who were writing at that time, as well as all of the history. And I discovered that Charles lived as part of the estate of the Hansboroughs, and that Peter Hansborough, uh, who was a very grand uh, personage in this uh, area from the late 18th uh, century to the uh, mid 19th century, was the father of many children. Uh, and this, I discovered, was part of uh, the local society here, that the White families were very large. They had uh, seven or eight children who lived to uh, more than uh, just a few years, and I'm sure they lost several along the way, and that the Black families were also quite large. I also began to discover that there were tremendous kinship relations in the area among the white families, among the black families, and among the black and the white families, there were ties that existed for a long period of time here in the Upper South. And this was evidenced in part by the complexion of some of the people who lived here and the facial features of some of the people who lived here. But as I could see, it was something that was forbidden to talk about. Indeed, it was a crime for a slave woman to reveal to her child or to anyone who the father of a child was. It was a crime. But I came to believe that many people had a sense of who their father was. And that in a number of instances, their father was, uh, as in the case of Peter Hansborough, he was, he was the father of Charles Knoll. Charles Knoll also had a half-brother who was uh, Blucher Hansborough, who was one of the children of uh, Peter Hansborough. And Blucher Hansborough later inherited um, Charles from his father. A few years ago, one of the great experiences that I had in my life was I got to visit Coles Hill, and, and Mr. Brown, who owned the, the property there, uh, allowed us to be uh, driven uh, through the property and to examine uh, some of the remnants of what had existed there in the old days. And I was in a hay wagon with a number of people going up the hill and up the hill, up the hill, uh, and going back in time in my own mind to the days that uh, Charles and uh, others had inhabited that ground. When we got to the top, we were directed to a grove where some of the cows had often congregated because it was a shady spot with bushes around there. And in the bushes, obscured by dirt, obscured by bushes, uh, one of the kids who was with us began to part some of the bushes away. And I do believe that that, that young black boy was a, was a descendant of Peter Hansborough. He revealed that the tombstone said, Peter Hansborough and the years of his life. And just as that occurred, as God is my judge and Gene was there, all of a sudden the heavens opened up and this thunder pounded us. There was no rain, but the, the, the heavens were pounding us with this incredible thunder and uh, it was a very, uh, a very moving experience. <coughs> Uh, there were a lot of uh, moving experiences along the way. This man is Colonel Tom, Colonel John Triplett Tom. Some of you may know some of these names. Colonel Tom was the owner 
of Charles's wife, Kitty. Kitty, with Colonel Tom and his large estate of many slaves and many of his children, lived at Berry Hill, which was one of the great homes in this area, antebellum homes. A magnificent estate. And Colonel Tom, who had known Thomas Jefferson, who'd known Chief Justice Marshall and many other great figures, was a former senator, former judge, and held many important posts uh, in this uh, region of Virginia for many years, I do believe was the father of Kitty, Kitty Sims. And I began to find that it was very common at that time in this region for a husband and a wife because they were not allowed to be married legally. Nevertheless, certain masters allowed their slaves to be married, and they had a ceremony and so on, just as they allowed some of their slaves from time to time to have a surname. And so I discovered some facts about the kind of life that they, uh, that they uh, had. And in terms of the name, where did the name come from? The name of Charles Nall, the name of Kitty Sims. Uh, I spent many years trying to figure out, was he connected to Nall, the Nall family? Was she connected to the Sims family? You know, how did this work out that people received a surname? Because most slaves did not have a surname. They were only known by Charles or Jacob or Lucy or Fanny. But some of the more privileged slaves did have a last name. And what I more or less concluded was that there was a, there was a convention in the area. And the convention was that we have a, a husband and we have a wife, but they live separately on separate farms in the area. They don't live in the same household. I'm talking about slaves now. It's too problematic to have them living together. If I'm ordering the man around, the wife may get angry. If I'm ordering the woman around or doing something with a woman that the husband won't like, that's going to create control problems as well. So we prefer to have a system where the family is split. And we have the husband over here and the wife over here. Charles was at Coles Hill. Kitty was at Berry Hill, about three miles away. And if we're going to give a, a, a surname, allow a surname, then Blucher Hansborough or Peter Hansborough is not going to allow the name Hansborough to be given to his slave because that would too much identify him with that estate. But we are going to allow a name that perhaps is connected to the family by marriage, and his, Blucher's wife was a Nall. She was Martinette Nall. And so it was the maiden name of the white slave master, I believe, that accounted for the name Nall. <coughs> Kitty and Charles... Uh, lived together uh, in, in marriage, but that meant that he had to sneak out from Coles Hill to travel to visit her, often at night, running through the fields. If he did not have a pass, he could be caught by the paddy rollers, and he could be severely punished, and he was caught a few times. And, in fact, one of the incidents that I describe in my book was that Upon returning from one of his nightly visits to visit his wife and family, uh, Charles came back to Coles Hill and found that the barn, which had contained the newly harvested wheat of Blucher Hansborough, was smoldering. There was a fire. And he alerted others at the farm. They tried to put it out, but the barn was a total loss. The newly harvested crop had been destroyed, and Blucher was very angry. And Blucher, who was described as a relatively kind 
uh, mastered in that he did not whip his slaves, nevertheless said, you have to reveal to me who lit this fire. And I suspect that because some of you have recently had some of your relatives sold south, you're angry about this, and this is payback, but nevertheless, you have to come forward and you have to admit that you set this fire, or if you know who did it, you have to reveal it, because if you don't, there are going to be consequences. Nobody revealed it. So as a result, a couple of days later, Charles and other males, part of his family, two of his brothers and some of the other slaves from Blucher's farm, were sent on an errand to the local mill. And when that happened, they were apprehended. They were shackled by uh, one of the leading uh, slave traders in the area. And they were going to be marched to Fredericksburg and then put on the train and sent to Richmond to be sold away. Through the grapevine, Kitty was informed of this. And she ran through the fields in her bare feet over the corn stalks and through the mud in the, in the, in the October uh, weather to try to head off this coffle that was being taken. And she was able to intercept it, throw herself on her knees. She knew all of the men that were holding these slaves. She was related to some of them. They were connected to her her whole life. She knew them. They knew her. She pleaded with them, please do not take my husband away. I can't lose my, my man. I can't lose my husband, the father of my children. Please, please. They took him away. And I found this picture of uh, a coffle uh, taken in this area, uh, recorded uh, in, uh, I think it was the 1830s. Some years later, in searching the area, I actually uh, found an area and took a picture. I believe it was exactly the same spot, that this was an accurate rendering of that uh, physical place. And Charles was taken eventually to Richmond, was put on sale. This was uh, 1848. And he and his brothers, who were very light-colored, Charles was said to be an octoroon, in fact, um, were deemed in Richmond to be so light-colored that they couldn't be sold. It was too problematic in Richmond to traffic someone of that color. And so they had to be returned to Blucher Hansboro. And from that point forward, Charles and his brothers always held in their minds a deeper suspicion of Blucher. He tried to do this to them, and they, their, their trust uh, had been further damaged. Finally, uh, a cataclysm occurred in 1855 for Charles and his growing family, and that was that Colonel Tom died, Kitty and her children, as part of the will of, of Colonel Tom, as well as some of his other slaves, were specified as being freed, manumitted, which meant that at that time, by law, they had to leave the state by law, or they would be re-enslaved. And so for Charles, this presented a huge problem. He had to recognize that his wife and children were going to be separated from him. And he made all kinds of efforts to raise the money to purchase his freedom and was able to actually come up with a good bit of money. I believe that Willis Madden assisted him. Samuel Madden, who was a son of Willis Madden, and, and who was a, uh, becoming a preacher in Baltimore, assisted him. And I also got into the fact that there was a local uh, man, a local white man, who 
also was part of the picture. And there are just so many things I can't get into the details. Here. A lot of this is laid out in my book, but one thing I will mention.